Here he comes. There he is. There he is. He's not there yet, but he's he's almost there. Can you see me? No. Nope. No, just it just says do ring. Do ring. See your last name. Hey. hey! There he is. That handsome devil. Yeah, look at this handsome guy. Is that a ukulele back there? Yeah. Hell yeah. Yeah. Don't I don't play it. All right, I was gonna say, I was I actually (laughs) also have a ukulele in here and I don't play it. So maybe we could jam, you know? Yeah, we could play the one chord. Exactly. I got that. Taped in front of a live studio audience. Yeah, Yeah. traveling. Taped in front of my cats. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) Somewhere. All right, Tyler, you want to get into this? Let's do it. Let's do it, man. All right. This is Open Walkie. I'm Tony. You got Mr. Rags over here. And we have our beautiful guest, Tyler Doring, producer and director of the culinary documentary. Stella, which I'm excited about, and a former camera operator for reality TV, like like all of us. <laughs> yep. Yeah, and then the uh, pandemic happened, and here we are. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And you're in Kansas City right now? Yeah. Yep. The oh, Kansas City swag Kansas on today. On. All right, dude. Give us a little, give us a little backstory of uh First of all, how you started like getting involved with film and TV and all that stuff. You can go back yeah. to, you know, your childhood days if you want. Do well, let's go all the way back to the beginning. I was uh an artistic little lad, like to draw, I did cartoons growing up. Uh didn't really like to read a whole lot, but uh liked a lot of the visual arts. I went to an art magnet high school uh started getting uh my studies done in uh some some economics decided that uh stuff you actually have to use your brain for i was no good at so thought maybe uh hey mom dad you care if i go to film school and they let me do it so i went to the university of kansas graduated there in uh, 2009 and there's not a ton of uh production in the area i mean there's some but uh Kind of figured I needed to get to a coast, so it was either California or New York, and I knew zero people in California and one person in New York, and so that's how I started my journey out east. Yeah. Nice. Do, uh, do we know that one person in New York? No, he works in finance. Ah. Okay. Oh, yeah. Well, that didn't that didn't help you move anywhere in your in your no. business. No, they, they're not a lot of uh, Bank of America commercials that need a lot of freelancers uh, straight out of film school. So, yeah, oh, yeah. yeah so I saw I, I did that and then I did events for a little bit and uh, got into reality TV via a friend I went to school with said, hey, I'm quitting a show. Do you want to take over for me as a production assistant? And that was on Pregnant and Heels. Oh, gosh. And uh, that's how I like fell into it, did reality TV for 10 years. That's what we worked on together. That's I think that's where I met. That's right. Pregnant and Hales. Right. Oh, really? You know what? I forgot I even did that show. Uh huh. That's how bad it was. Yeah, I remember that. Yeah, it was. Uh, it was interesting. It was with with Amy Hall, and you were on there. It's kind of like a rotating crew because it was it ran for a while. It took a while to shoot it. So it yeah, I didn't. I, I didn't do the whole at least thing. three different DPs. Yeah. That's fun. You were a, what an assistant camera operator on that? I, I don't know. I have no clue. Like I said, I I honestly up until you yeah. just brought it up, I forgot that I even worked on the <laughs> show. So yeah, yeah. So um, it would take at least nine months to shoot an episode, then, right? Yeah, that was it. Was uh, took ten years, three episodes. Uh, <laughs> it was. Uh... <laughs> they're really pumping out content on that one, right? Well, they're really long episodes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, well, with what's going on now, man, I'm I'm super proud of you with the uh the Stella and everything when you posted that that trailer. I was yeah. like, well, we got to talk that. to Tyler, man. So that's <laughs> awesome. You're doing big things and uh that other um that other short film you did um with the actor Alex Salamat or Salamat, yeah. 
yeah that was that was pretty cool too so, so i've done a, i've done I've actually done a couple with him before are you talking about the uh the world war ii one that i did um I doesn't believe, sound like it was it in was he it was running around in the one he was in the woods running around the both world. of them actually <laughs> okay that's what kind of my that? genre i, got, I, got I don't know what i'm talking about what's the other one called i gotta i gotta think of that so we have the two that we're talking about right now dust is dust. uh it, that's in uh world war ii yeah that's, that's the world the war ii short uh and then there was another one satori which was sort of like a sci-fi cool yeah sci-fi. What, was, what was the inspiration I, for those because you wrote those right i did i wrote those and Quick aside, it turns out Alex Salamat, the guy that was in both of those, lives six doors down now. Oh, really? In Kansas City. Yeah. Wow. That's crazy. Yeah. Is it, he's, is he so, just hey, man, let's grab some coffee. And he's like, wait a minute. Are you, is, I told him where I lived. He's like, thought I was, he was being punked or something. <laughs> yeah. Is he following you or are you following him? Um, I think uh, the coronavirus oh. kind of just pushed us both around and we both wound up back here. We're both from i mean i'm from wichita he's from here but i ended up back in kansas city so just happened to land 700 feet away from each other that's crazy how that works out yeah that's just nuts yeah Um, and you uh so the documentary you guys shot that during the pandemic right yeah we shot it before the pandemic we started in 2018 um without really a plan on what it was going to be we went to a this pizzeria was supposed to be one of the best in the world and i just asked him after the meal because it was made such an impression on me i was like can we can we do something with you and he was like yeah okay sure sure whatever so i didn't know we were going to make a five minute short on how to make pizza or or what it was what was going to come up um and we just we went over there a couple times and we as we were doing the research we discovered that there's never been a pizzeria that's won a michelin star so that kind of drove the story and then it became a two-part documentary about this restaurant and pizzeria but also about the michelin guide and kind of how their process works and what they how they fit into the world of gastronomy and then you know as we all know now once upon a time in wuhan the world all changed <laughs> yeah. and uh, that gave us some time to edit because uh, a little hard to travel, a lot of uh, culinary uh, events going on during that time as well. Yeah. Especially um, at that time. Oh yeah. He, it was, it was tough. Um, but fortunately it's, you know, it's a small, it's a small place and it's in a, um, a difficult neighborhood that I think that, you know, it's not exactly like on the, it's not 11 Madison Park or something that's probably got egregious rent. I mean, it's a family owned business in a, in a quieter neighborhood. So he was able to, to, to ride the storm out. And we, we actually went over there on the kind of the tail end of the pandemic and filmed with him a little bit more. And then we went back, uh, you know, once everything was a little bit more back to normal. So it was a pre mid and post pandemic documentary. Nice. Yeah. So where did it all take place? In Naples, Italy, uh, in a neighborhood called Sanita, um, which is the historically the it's essentially means like health neighborhood. I think it, it's there was hospitals around that area. Um, and it's kind of like in, in a literal sense, kind of on the wrong side of the tracks. They they cut off part of Italy during World War Two and it put a lot of pressure on on the neighborhood. And because of that, they've had a lot of uh, socioeconomic problems, but it's a, it's a passionate neighborhood. And, um, the, the folks in that neighborhood are trying really hard through pizzerias and tourism and, and cultural incentives to try to bring people, not just into that neighborhood, but into Naples and, and sort of like, you know, make a, uh, a better future for themselves there. Yeah. Yeah. That's great. Oh, um, what what made you go over to Naples? Like, what was the whole? Point like, why was I there to begin with? Yeah, uh, my brother in law was in the Navy, and he was stationed in Naples, uh, and and so we were visiting him. And uh, like I said, he just said, "Hey, you know, while we're here, you want to go to this pizzeria? I know a guy that is friends with this this chef, and it's supposed to be you know the crazy long lines and hard to get into, but he can you know he'll he'll." call them up and get us a table. And so we did, and we ate there for like five hours and their sommelier is incredible. And it was like, 
12 courses, seven paired wines. We, like I said, it was all night long and it was like 50 euros a person. Wow. Yeah. That's yeah. crazy. That's that was yeah. the last place I actually traveled to was in uh, Sardinia and um, we went oh, there. Right. Sure. It's like the, the culture there is amazing. Like just the Italian culture of you actually sit down and you have a meal and it takes like three to four hours. You know, right. it's, not, it's not like, you know, us Americans just rushing through everything. Push everybody but, um, out. Right. Get yeah. the next ones in. They actually, they well, actually but, value it. It's all fresh. But if you, uh, if you are an American and you know that about their culture, you can get into places you order, ordinarily couldn't because you can be like, no, 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 I'm an American. I just, you just serve me real quick and I'll get out of here. Yeah. I'm like, all right, but you have to be out of here in under five hours. And it's right. like, mm, we'll squeeze it in. Okay. <laughs> That's great, man. Um, uh, do, yeah. you, do you speak Italian, Tony? Nope. I can understand a neither little did, bit. Neither do Neapolitans. Yeah. <laughs> really? Yeah, so my my rudimentary understanding of Italian, I studied, I took two years in uh, in college. Didn't get me anywhere over there. No. It's, I took, it's a very different dialect. I took a Italian class in high school, and uh, I learned how to say, can I go to the bathroom? And then I just uh -huh. would never come back to class. And that was... <laughs> That was my whole, that was well, all you Italian, need. you know, language. Yeah. Um, yeah, going over there with, with Pablo, actually, who speaks Spanish, he's Cuban, as you know, uh, he was able to communicate with them in Spanish about as well as I could in Italian. Okay. Well, so it was pretty useless. Yeah, mine was, yeah, for the most part. <laughs> and they're, they're, it's, it's funny because they don't, um, they will not help you. <laughs> They'll just let you sit there going, uh, humana, humana, and just staring at you going like, you're really making a fool of yourself, man. Yeah. Yeah. Man. I, f I found that same way in, uh, in Sardinia. It's uh same thing. They just look at you like, yeah, well, you're not going to, in a weird way, that's endearing. Whatever. Yeah. Whatever. You just start using sign language. You right. Know? Like, Hey, just pointing. Mm -hmm. uh, it works out eventually. Dude, what was um, the um, what was the steps from the documentary? Like, you know how you said um, you just went there, found the pizza place, it was great, and all that stuff, and you decided to go back. Like, where did you, you know, did you get funding? Did you like look into all that stuff before? Or you just was like, you know, well, when we stuff? when we took the initial trip, I I just called up Pablo and I was like, I found the thing that we should do, um, and it was myself, uh, Pablo, Carlos Gonzalez, uh. Matt Augusta, who's a sound guy, and um, uh, Anthony DeLeo, Tony DeLeo. And we went over there, Tony brought a steady cam, and we were just sort of like really feeling it out the first time. Um, you know, we we got a car, we did everything right. You know, we flew over there and had five guys all put up an Airbnb. And like, that's just not the way that, they that our subjects of the documentary really wanted to do it it wasn't going to be like a structured type of thing it was more like yeah come through tomorrow and talk to us or maybe don't come tomorrow <laughs> so <laughs> yeah. uh we found very quickly that while we got a ton of amazing b-roll in the in the neighborhood and it was it was raining and we got you know a lot of texture and that sort of thing uh the next time back through it was, you know, we didn't get a car and we just had a much smaller uh, package of equipment and uh, much more informal. And it, it, it worked much better to just sort of like show up and be like, hey, we're going to do an interview. What what day can we do it on? And by the so I think we went over there a total of five times, one of which we didn't even tell him we were coming. And it was just Pablo. I just <laughs> He just had the mic straight to camera and he just knocked on the door and said like, Oh, Hey, uh, I need to get some stuff. And we and got was, what we needed. Like you weren't there. It was just Pablo just showed up. No, yeah. Up. Solo mission. Mm -hmm. Nice. Good for him. Did, uh, yeah. did you guys just buy like a one way ticket since you didn't know how long you should stay or would stay or when you would get, well, did we knew that we weren't going to get it all. Like the first time we went, we knew it was not, we weren't going to get it all no matter what, no matter how long it was, we just wasn't going to happen in, in one trip anyway. So 
I think the first time we were there for maybe five days or something like that. And we just figured we'll get everything that we can and then start to shape something. And from there, know, have a better idea of what we would need the next time, which worked pretty well. Uh, we got some sort of like introductory interviews with, with people and, and just followed them around during dinner service and that sort of stuff. Um, and then after that, we were, even though it was still pretty nebulous and sort of like loose, he was like, okay, I'll take you to the next time you come, I'll take you to a tomato farm uh, and the mozzarella factory. Um, and, and we didn't have a schedule or like a, a call sheet or anything, but we just knew that we're going to be here for these three days. And he was like, you know, called his people, didn't tell us what, what the schedule was, but he was like, yeah, yeah meet me at my apartment at six in the morning and we're going to drive out to San Marzano and see where we get my tomatoes. Mm, nice. uh, so it was loose, but it was also like, you know, we knew we had, these are the days that we'll be here. These, this is what we're going to do, you know, and then he sort of like handled it from there. Okay. So there's a little bit of structure. Yeah, it was, it was structured in that it was like, we had, we, we had little fence posts where mm -hmm. we were like, we we're, we're not going to be able to do anything until this day. Yeah. We have to get everything done by this day. And if we don't get it, if we don't get it in, then, you know, like we wanted to go, for example, to where he gets his oil, his olive oil, and he couldn't make it work. So I was like, okay, that's not gonna be in the documentary then. So, you know, and, and, and that ended up being fine, but, um, you know, it made him also sort of put the order of importance of like the things that he made sure he want. It was important for us to follow for the documentary. He made sure that those were up front on the, okay. those got, those got filmed. Well, that's good. He he was he he worked with you guys. He was easy to yeah kind of. Uh, well, I wouldn't say easy. I mean, it's well, it, it took it took a long time, and sure. uh, you know, um, and he's super busy, super passionate, and super young. Um, so at the when we started, he was twenty five. Oh wow, wow. Kid. he's a yeah. baby. I know, right? Yeah. Damn. Yeah, funny. and he's and and we we got we got relatively lucky with our timing too because I I don't know that he would say yes now. I mean, he's. Uh, you, you know, he's on the, the Italian version of Good Morning America and stuff now. He, he's got much more um, cachet, you know, in the industry now. I, I don't know that he needs a small documentary to come and tell the story of his pizzeria anymore. You got in at the perfect time. It was, uh, it, it was, it was fate. You know. Yeah, yeah. In a lot of ways, that's probably true. Did um, had, did you guys do some like crowdfunding or like, or was it all out of pocket? Because we did it over such a long period of time, like we didn't have to just pony up and slap down the money right from day one. We yeah. ended up just being able to to self fund it because it was just like you know one trip here, we'll get some plane tickets and borrow right. some gear from friends, and sure. and then like I said, it was just like all right, I think we I think we might need to go back one or two more times. This is what it's going to cost, and but it was over almost four years. Right. Okay. Oh wow, I didn't know it was that long. Yeah. The filming, the actual filming of it was probably closer to three. Um, but then, and then in the middle of it, there was almost a year where we didn't, we didn't get anything done because it's like, you couldn't even travel domestically really on a plane uh, with, you know, with any relative ease. I mean, there was, you still had, everybody had to be masked up and it's like, do we really want to go to a restaurant when everybody's wearing a face mask? And like, by the time this is done, like, we don't want a reminder of, yeah. Hey, let's go out exactly. to a restaurant and everybody's sitting there with their, I know, like the their beer on their face. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Put the, put the mask on until you sit down to eat and then it's fine. And the virus. And then you're, you you can not yeah. you can't spread it at that no, point so, you're at your table. All it's right. so dumb. <laughs> it's so dumb if you think about it. It's like, yeah, well. What are you going to do? We made it. We, yeah. we learned. We That's all exciting. learned. Um. And then, uh, and now you just uh, you just won some awards, didn't you? At, um, at yeah, we were just at the Kansas City Film Festival, Kansas City Film, uh, Festival. and we won the best Heartland documentary. Wow, congratulations! Which is like documentary from the region, yeah. Thanks. That's huge. That's, that's awesome. Yeah. So, uh, so where where do you go from here now? What's uh, what's what's the next plan for for the doc? Well, uh, there's another festival coming up next month in the middle of the month. Uh, they haven't given their uh, official announcement yet. So depending on uh, when this episode airs, I 
probably can't say where that is because it's you know yeah. I don't want to I don't want to get knocked for that, but it but that's a, a pretty exciting one. And so I'll, I'm going to go out there for that. Okay. Um, and you know we'll we'll see uh, if you know networking that way and meeting some more people and hopefully that'll help me for you know the next thing. But we've also got a uh, a sales agent based in Germany called Magnet Film. They've been they've been great. Um, you know, and it's going to be probably chopping it up and and selling the rights to to different regions, kind of piece by piece. Yeah. Um, you know, I think everybody would love to just say, "Hey, Netflix, do you want the, all the worldwide rights?" And you just give me all the money in the world. But you know, as as you know, it's a it's a documentary, so that's a hard ask anyway. So it's, a, yeah, it's right. more of a process, which. You know, but it gets out yeah. there. When, like, you know, winning that award with your first, that was your first one you submitted to, right? No. I was actually more or less done submitting when that was, I think the, I think we got 32 no's. Wow. Before we got into that one. Um, which, I mean, not to, at the risk of sounding arrogant, uh, it's like, I mean, I didn't think I was going to just take the world by storm, but that's a, that's a very, strong track record of no like more so than i ever really would have expected but i think the opposite of what i expected to have happened was that i was like oh okay great nobody's making documentaries right now because people can't travel this is going to be perfect it's the opposite this documentary is the only thing people could work on so there was a lot of really good content people circling back and finishing that thing that they hadn't had time to edit or whatever um so for was coming out of the pandemic when we finished, like it was sort of a feeding frenzy. It was the, a lot of the best stuff that came out in a long time was coming out around that time. And, you know, we were just one more documentary and didn't fit whatever the, uh, the festivals wanted to, to have screening in their blocks, which is, uh, you know, I, I understand that, you know, it's a pizza documentary is a specific thing. It's not necessarily, gonna be a, a smash hit at Sundance I mean yeah. that's like uh that's like a classic success story though it's like you you hear all these stories about like these directors and writers and stuff who have like these classic movies that we all know and then you hear the backstory it's like yeah all these studios said no everybody hated it nobody wanted it nobody wanted to air it then there was that one person that that put it out and it blew up so like, yeah I was well, I always like to thing. refer to myself as a, as a classic success story. That's that's just you know, yeah. Tyler in a nutshell. It's well, I mean, classic it's just, and success. It takes that one, you know. It takes that one thing, like Rags was saying. It's like so you already got that. Now you got that award, that little badge to stick up there on the. Uh, yeah, the little trailer put on it. the website. Exactly. Yeah. So then that'll keep you moving. Right. Yeah. Totally. No, that's good though, man. Do you want to? Um, do you want to share the trailer or do you want to talk about it more? Cause yeah. you edited the whole thing, right? No, oh. didn't. that was actually probably the smartest thing I did on the whole thing was once we, like I said, once we got into the, uh, the throes of the pandemic and I was trying to figure out what I, what we were going to do, I decided uh, to have uh, Jeff Van Bocker and my editor who he's worked on a lot of my short films. I met him in, in uh, film school, like, you know, over 15 years ago. Um, asked him if he would do it and he's did a fantastic job better than I ever could have done. Um, both from a, from a technical aspect, but I mean, he's, he's a fantastic editor, but also like, I would have never been able to, to kill my darlings on, you know, the, Oh, I think we need to include this story. And he never even thought about, he's like, that's, we got to stay laser focused on what the story is. And he really kept the narrative tight, kept, kept it really, uh, made it really sing so that's great great. that you can get involved with like a creative editor because there's a lot of them out there that are just very technical and um they don't they don't think that way you know so that's yeah he's good because he really also kind of pushed me to like okay go with me on this i I don't know if you're gonna like it but let me show you something and sometimes i was like "Eh, i don't know i don't think that's what we want to do and other times it's like never would have thought of doing it that way I think right. it's great. I think it's yeah. way better than I ever would have would have thought doing it. <laughs> All right. So let's see here. Let's pull up the man. You know, I'm such a lot. I, I make I'm a filmmaker and I don't even know how to share my damn screen. You know, what? we don't either. It's so it's 
it's we're a learning curve is just figuring this out like a bunch of monkeys i know we were just doing this with another with another guy this guy tyler there's actually another tyler yeah and um he was sharing his screen and it was just it wasn't working out <laughs> well I, I i i think i've got it if you're if you guys are ready let's do it yeah all right here we go Nel nostro impasto abbiamo solo quattro ingredienti. Acqua, sale, farina e lievito. Quattro semplici elementi che riescono a fare miracoli. With pizza, it's a pair of hands that open a dough, top it, and then bake it. And every step of that process is truly significant. The idea that this very much peasant food has become so artisanal and appreciated for quality is a really remarkable shift. The recognition of the for a pizzeria is to receive the Michelin. For food, you know, it's Michelin. That, oh, you've made it and that you're a solid success. I kind of come to terms with maybe I won't ever be a Michelin star chef, and that's fine. And then it happened, and I was like, wow, I care about this way more than I thought I was going to. You're standing at the bottom of the mountain looking up at the peak, and, and that's the peak. Nine times out of 10, people laugh when I say it started out as tires. I don't think they dreamed that they'd be this elite guide to making or breaking a restaurant. La Michelin ancora non ha deciso di mettere le stelle alla pizza. When you're given the star, now the clock starts ticking on maintaining it. They feel tremendous pressure not to fall. In what ways is he prepared to get it? Questo obiettivo da raggiungere non è soltanto mio ma è di tutte le pizzerie e di tutte le persone che vivono in questa città. Sarebbe qualcosa di incredibile. Un sogno che diventa realtà. Really beautiful, man. Yeah, yeah. shout out to Pablo. He really really made it come alive. Yeah, yeah Pablo dude. Diego. It looks like you guys shot some food stuff before that, like some food shows. <laughs> yeah. No, that's that's. I, I I personally have not actually, but uh, really, yeah, mine has been uh, pretty much chef's table, doesn't he? Uh, I don't think so. He's done some stuff for Netflix, but I don't think he's done chef's table. Yeah, I mean, chef's table is beautiful. That that was that that trailer is amazing. That looks Thanks. It looks perfect. So. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, but again, again, shout out to Jeff. Shout out to Pablo. They, as much as I'd like to just take all the credit, I really can't. No, nah, man, you got a good team, well, and that's true, right? that's that's a that's a big thing. It's uh, yeah, Pablo's great. I'd love to have him come on here and talk to. I haven't seen that guy in a while. Yeah, I was just uh, out in, I was just in Morocco with him. Oh, that's right. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, we're yeah, it's there. it's funny because he likes to try to embarrass me in real life um, and put me in uncomfortable positions. And whenever there's uh, an interview or a uh, film festival, the tables turn. Yeah, and it's like he <laughs> he gets a little bit more you know out of his element, and it's like, all right, Bob, I'll step right up. Let's uh, yeah. let's rehash all the other times you tried to make a fool out of me. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Right. Payback time. That's the perfect partnership. Yeah. Uh, Alba was out there with us, too. Oh, yeah. I haven't talked to him in a long time. I love Alba. Yeah. yeah. He's, he's doing good. What, um, he's still doing the cartoons and everything? Because I know you were posting a lot of, like, really amazing, elaborate um, drawings before. You know, the only cartoons I really draw is uh, monsters for a two-and-a-half-year-old on the chalkboard, but uh yeah i i, I uh, i've actually done some storyboards for some people for some corporate stuff uh, you know i try to try to keep the keep the pen moving but 
not as much as I used to. Yeah. That's, that's awesome though, man. He's super talented. Oh, I was like, yeah, you started posting some stuff. I'm like, I had no clue. I had no clue you could draw like that. No. Uh, yeah. So, um, where, um, is this, is the Stella movie like specifically just playing in, um, in, um, festivals right now, or do you have it out somewhere? Yeah, it's not anywhere that's um, publicly available yet in the United States. Um, hoping that uh, we kind of just got underway with our with our sales agent, and um, they're actually the ones that got us into the the festival that we're going to be going into next month. And uh, I think they're going to do a really good job and 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 get the American markets figured out at some point. Um, I know it. I mean, eventually, it, on a long enough time frame. I mean, even if we just have to release it on on YouTube for ad revenue, it'll, it'll be available here somewhere. So, I mean, there's, there's plenty of people, friends and family that still haven't seen it. And it's like, man, if we're, we're this close, just hold on yeah. a little bit longer. Yeah. You just want to, you want to get it out there. Yeah. Are you, uh, are, are you still doing TV stuff or are you doing, are you like spearheading the documentary full time? Like, is that, is that your full time gig right now? My full time gig now is uh, being a stay at home dad for the most part. Um, okay. Cool. We, uh, again, not to keep hitting on the pandemic, but it was kind of like everything I was getting offered was travel. And then at the time it was like, well, it's not really worth having to like, you know, seclude myself after traveling for a few days. And then I have to not be around my family for a few days. And, um, so we just, we got set up here and, and I've been working on the documentary a lot, which is fortunately now you know, the, the lion's share of that is behind us. So it's, a, it's a lot more emails and phone calls about that sort of thing. Now, uh, I actually took a call to, to shoot something coming up pretty soon, I think, but, um, you know, for the most part, we're in, we're in pre-production for a feature that we're going to shoot in October. Um, oh. but it's not, uh, not a, a day to day yet on that. So. Okay. Nice. What's the That's feature exciting. about? Yeah. What's the feature? Uh, it's a, uh, script that I wrote, I uh, started about, I think four years ago. Uh, I said I was, I wasn't going to try to do anything with it until I quarterfinaled in the Nichols fellowship, uh, which is put on by the Academy. And then last year I was fortunate enough to semifinal. So I was like, all right, let's, let's take a swing at it. Uh, and it's about a, um, uh, blue collar single mother that's, uh, trying to get back her mother's inheritance from her. Uh, father who's a petty criminal and, and it's sort of a, the, the classic just when you think you're out they pull you back in mm -hmm. type of a gritty crime drama so yeah. what was the inspiration from that you like knew somebody like that well i am a single mother um as you know um <laughs> No, I just, I honestly, like I was joking earlier that, um, you know, a guy in the woods is kind of my, kind of my genre. So yeah. I more or less started with that, just knowing where we can film and, and tried to write something that was, that was evergreen. We could shoot at any time of the year. We could shoot it anywhere. It could be Kansas. It could be upstate New York. It could just pretty much be anywhere except for a metropolitan area. Um, and it would be the type of thing that I think I, I could fundraise um, and hopefully be a, a uh, with those constraints and engaging enough story to to be entertained. So that's really it was just written to to try to give myself something that I could I could direct um, on a on a budget that I thought we could we could actually achieve. We I've I've also written like an art heist that takes place in London. You know, when I get a hundred million dollars, maybe I'll circle back and and take a look at that one, but. Yeah, you know, not exactly in the cards right now. Right. Uh, so you're going to direct. I assume Pablo's going to DP. Yep. Yeah. Yep. As long as he's not jet setting around the world working with you. Right. <laughs> um, so where you said you're in pre-production for that? Where? Uh, where do you, you said you could shoot it anywhere? But where? Like, wh where ideally are you planning on shooting that? Well, when I, when I started writing it, that was, that was like, you know, like I said, years ago and I was living in New York and I kind of, um, I kind of Im imagined sort of, you know, Schenectady, New York, like a, a place beyond the pines type of, you know, just sort of upstate somewhere type of thing. Cause that's yeah. more or less where I was. Um, and then after we moved here, I 
kind of realized like, well, really I was just writing Kansas, but going to shoot it in New York. Mm -hmm. So the plan is to shoot it now that I'm here. And I think we'll be able to get the fundraising in place, which is, you know, easier said than done. But I think, uh, since it's more or less here or someplace that is like here, the plan is to shoot here in, you know, roughly the end of the third quarter. So like October ish. Okay. Nice. Okay. What, what's the, um, what's your like writing game plan kind of like, how do you like just get that discipline to sit down and start writing? Cause I know there's a lot of people out there, me included, how it's like, I'll write like a quarter of something and then just never go back to it. So how do you like stick with that? Well, I, I mean, I think in a general way, it's about, it's about routine. You know, it's like going to the gym. It's, it's a lot of times it's not fun to do it. You know, it's, you're stuck on a problem or it's, you know, you're writing that one thing that has to connect to another thing and you sit there for six hours and you write three lines and then you realize that was all crap and you threw away half a day it sucks, but it's about just finding if it's, you know, an hour in the morning or an hour in the evening. I personally have, uh, I was actually on a call with my writing partner um, just before this. We have a call every day when my son goes down for a nap and he takes his lunch break. And we just, you know, outline or, or write or whatever. And we do it every year, working our way up to the Nichols Fellowship. Um, you know, start something new once we submit. And the, we submitted yesterday, actually. So we're going to start something new tomorrow and it's about just, you know, five days a week having that call and, and trusting that like by doing it and showing up every day, writer's block isn't real. Really. I, I don't think it's just you, you're stuck. And if you can just show back up at the gym, you can have bad days, you know, and it's just about, I'm doing it at this time every day. And if it's, if you can't do it at the same time every day, I guess, set benchmarks for, um, a certain amount of time every week, you know, or it, but it's just really about like holding yourself just like a diet, you know, like you can have cheat days, but you got to really like have the regularity to, to get it done. Otherwise you, you go on a blitz and you bunch done really quick and you go like, Oh, I'm doing great. And then you, before you know it, it's six months and you haven't done anything. Yeah. That's yeah. a good analogy. Is that, you know, at, at the gym, you, you plateau. And then you have yeah. to you have to get over that hump and figure out how to go beyond that plateau. So that applies to writing too, I guess. Right. Yeah. And finished is better than perfect. That's a that's a adage I believe wholeheartedly. It's better to just get to the end instead of trying to make something that's pristine and and perfect. It's better to get to the end of something because writing is rewriting. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I right. feel like I mean a lot of people get hung up on that trying to make things perfect and that's just not it's not going to happen it's like there's right. no such thing and, and perfect is subjective anyway so yeah, yeah. you it's can rewrite right. forever same thing with lighting like you're never done lighting you like you light you light something and then you want to keep lighting and changing and adding and subtracting and like right just, well i mean i think it was fellini said something to the effect of like you don't finish a film, you abandon it. Oh, okay. That's, I think that is kind of goes for every step along the way. You just, at some point you have to stop writing it, but you have to right. get to the end first. I think you know, at some point like, you have to stop shooting it. That goes to the point where like, just a, being a creative person in general, it's like you, everything stems from something else. You're like, Oh shit. Like I want to do it differently now, but you've already went through such a step when you're like, okay, well I can't change it now. So it's going to use that, right. use that idea for something else and move along. Those are, that's also, I think the source of real creativity too, is it's like, Oh no, we got rained out for a day. So our two day shoot is a one day shoot. Yeah. What are we going to do? And you realize that like, I didn't need this whole sequence. Let's cut that, you know, or you come up with a creative solution. Like what if he does this instead? And it's like, wow, that's actually so much more fun to to watch. And you never would have done it if everything went perfectly. Yeah, yeah, like stepping away from the pro project and coming back with like a new perspective. Because yeah, yeah, it's it's easy to get tunnel vision on something, and then you're like, okay, you know what? I can't see this any differently. So let me take a couple of days and come back. And uh, right. you always look at something different. It's uh, that's a cool cool process. What's your um, what's your process about like funding? Because you you've done all um, 
you've clearly done a lot of like um documentaries and and uh went out for funding and you know how how do you go about the process of like getting funding for anything or even just submitting to like what what film festivals you want to submit to yeah so i think um well so there's a couple questions there one is is like where does the money come from i think sometimes you just keep it small enough that the money doesn't really have to come from anywhere because it's like you're making a two thousand dollar short film it's like you can anybody can get a kickstarter for a, a really small amount of money or just you know save a little bit and, and do it themselves um I, i've done both ways um you can spread it out like we did with the documentary where it's, you know, you just spend a little bit over a long period of time. If you're, if you've got the, um, you know, the bandwidth to keep up with something for a long time and you don't feel like you're going to abandon it. Um, but to be, I mean, to be fully transparent, I think the thing that I'm learning about the, the, the big picture stuff, the something at the scale that like, you know, it's more money than I made in the, than I would make in years of, to fund a, a independent feature film. Is that there's not really like a magic bullet for that. You know, it's there's there's not really like the one way that it's like follow my and, and I think you probably get ads on Instagram for it and stuff like like everybody does of like when people go out to try to fund a film, they do these things wrong, follow my approach. And it's like, yeah, I'm sure that works a lot. And I'm sure that there's, there's good pointers in there, but there's really just not, you know, if you have a rich uncle that'll pay for the whole thing. Great. That's a lot of people have that. A lot of people don't have that. Some people have to call up every dentist they know and be like, can I have a hundred bucks? And they just put together tiny little pieces of, of a film until they have it. Some people never fund a film. Uh, and so the short version of that answer is like, I, as corny as it is, I'm just not learning as we go along. Um, and I think the main thing is just that there's a lot of steps along the road. Most of those, most of those roads are cul-de-sacs that end in a no. And that's fine. That's just part of the process. You know, if you're, if you're going door to door, you know, trying to sell something, if you only go around one block, you're not going to have very good sales. But if yeah. you just keep pounding pavement, eventually like something will give, things will start to move. You know, people will hear about like, Oh, that's the guy that's, that's going around town and, and talking to these people. Maybe he's got something that I want to hear about. And you get past that inertia a little bit and it starts to move. Uh, and I think your question about the um, the film festivals, our our approach, which was also probably why we got um, declined from as many as we did, is that I um, I started with the list of Academy Award qualifying festivals. Not that I thought I was going to, I wanted to qualify for Academy Award, but I wanted to start with that caliber of of festival. I wanted to make sure that we hit, you know, Berlin, Cannes, Sundance without even really thinking like, yeah, I'm for sure going to get into these big, these big things, but it's sort of like, you're, you know, you're offering up to the film gods that it's like, who knows? And then from there, it's like, you know, you don't, if you just, if you just go on, you know, film freeway, or I guess that's you know without a box when it still existed. And you're just saying, I'm going to submit to everything. Cause I want to collect laurels. I want to have a thousand awards on my website. Then it it changes the perception of the film too. You know, it's like if you're the this really obscure film festival that nobody's even aware of, that's really just like a laurel mill. Um, it's it's going to cheapen the oh. product for you know Tribeca is not going to program you if they're the twenty fifth festival that has accepted you, and all of the other ones are these tiny little like rec center you know, film festivals. And there's nothing wrong with those. That's, I mean, I've, I've played little film festivals too, but as a business strategy, this wasn't, this wasn't a short film or a pet project. This was something that we wanted to be able to have as much, you know, life in terms of like a business strategy as possible. And we didn't want to hobble ourselves by, you know, showing off that we won a bunch of awards that are more or less made up. Yeah. Well, now that you have that one award, is there is there a possibility of like resubmission to something else? Like the next time it comes along, like with that same film, 
You know what I'm saying? Because yeah, that's actually maybe now they're going to look at our, it a little differently. Yeah, that's actually kind of what our sales agent has done. Is um, we gave them the list of what uh, we submitted to, and they said, "Okay, here's what we're going to submit to." And I would say probably half of the um, of the festivals that they had on their on their hit list were ones that we had we had already gone through the the cycle one time before, and. And I don't know. I mean, part of me thinks that like, you know, a submission coming from a sales agent, that's like, you know, they're sort of not a gatekeeper, but sort of a taste maker that they're like, I'm saying this is good, that maybe there's a different type of consideration on the other end. You know, I'm, I'm, I guess, romantic enough that I would like to believe that if you do something really great, it'll just, it'll play where it deserves to play. But I do think that there's there's a little bit of both. Like I don't think that having the best sales agent in the world is going to take a crap film and get it, you know, opening night on at Sundance. But I also don't think that if you have a really fantastic project and you just sort of like send it out and submit it a couple of places, that it's going to automatically get in anywhere. I think that there's probably a little bit of give and take. And I think that the once you get into one thing, I think then. It shows up on some people's radar. You know, the programmers talk to each other. Some of them work at multiple festivals. Yeah. Um, you know, the, they and they at the end of the day, they want to just have good stuff in there. And if that means that they're getting it from some guy they don't know or some guy they do know, I I think ultimately, like they would prefer to have something better than something else, not have some nepotistic, you know, like yeah. shoved into their festival. Yeah, exactly. That makes sense. Yeah, but we'll just I guess we'll just have to see. Like I said, I got I had a pretty good uh, batting average of straight strikeouts for, you know, full full year of making it. And then now here we are. I've got I won an award at our first festival and then I got into another pretty big one. So, I mean, maybe it's the maybe the tides are turning. Yeah, yeah. maybe these are the two outliers. Who knows? It's hard well, to a lot say. of things is timing, too, you know, so it's. Yeah. Sure. Um, yeah. What were you saying, Rex? I. I was just saying it's the beginning. Persistence is the name of the game, it seems. Yeah, man. Yeah, I think that that might be my X-Man superpower is just Persistence. I won't, won't stop until it's a hard no. That's essentially how we got Michelin involved in the documentary is I was like, I'm not going to stop emailing these guys until somebody says, stop emailing us. We're not doing yeah, it. Right. And it was just sort yeah. of like kicking the can on down the road of like, I don't know, let me go ask the, the other people. And it's like, OK, let me know what they say. Hey, yeah. what'd those people say? And then eventually I was just like, Hey, I'd like to speak to the international director. Um, can I interview him? I'm, I can come out on these days. And they were like, okay. I was like, Whoa, cool. All right. Hey, it's a yes. Hey, why not? It went from over a year of them just going like, yeah, we'll, uh, we'll see what we can do. And then like, yeah, sure. Those days work for us. Right. Yeah. You, you do that. In a good mood. I, I yeah, love right. that. I love that you're not getting discouraged too. I mean, that's, that's a big piece of advice for people that, you know, it's, it's, it takes a lot to just keep going and doing all that stuff because, you know, you know, you have a good product, you know, you have a good, you know, you have a good film. It's just getting in front of the the right people. Like Rags was saying earlier too. It's like, you just need that one person to be like, you know what? I love this. This is, this is great. You know? Right. Yeah, so because, you know, there's different perspectives everywhere and everyone has a different, you know, energy towards this, certain this, things. This is going to start off in a very going a very dark direction, but I swear it's going to circle back. Craig Mazin, who is the uh, screenwriter of The Last of Us, and he did Chernobyl before that and he came from comedy. He on his podcast uh, has pretty much said you need to take a hard look at your career and decide if you should quit if you want to do film um and a lot of people should a lot of people should take a look at their career and hang up their hat because they don't they're not capable of making anything worthwhile but this is where it's going to start coming back around i think that if you're the type of person that looks at what you want to do and you're you're am i going to quit it's not even a question it's just like, yeah, maybe what I'm doing is crap, but I'm going to keep doing it and I'm going to try to get better. I'm going to focus and practice and and, and try to grow. Then the, like, that's the type of person. And I'm, I mean, only time will tell if 
I or you guys are those people, but like, you know, until it's just like, I, like I was saying, like if, if they send me the, the email says stop calling, we're not doing it, then I'll stop calling and, and won't do it. But, you know, as long as I finish a documentary and I think it's good and it gets into a festival, then like, well, all right, well, why not try it again? Yeah. Or I'll be broke. I mean, I don't know. <laughs> Pretty much keep going until they put a restraining order on you. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> well, it's also, you're going to learn. Law. You're going to learn from, you know, stuff that you might want to do differently next time, you know, yeah. from all that stuff. So that's, I mean, hey, that's you all don't, you do. don't know what you don't know until you learn it. So exactly. You've got to try. And, you know, nobody knows how to do this stuff right away. There's so many different paths that you can take and so many different options you have. But there's some people that don't know how to do it after you do it. Yeah. Mm-hmm. True. True. <laughs> um, you guys, so like you guys have a company with Pablo and, and um, what's that? You still do that thing, right? The, is it Twin Coyote? Uh, yeah. Right now that's essentially just the documentary. Uh, we, we did a little bit of like some online content and corporate content, that sort of thing. Um, but now with me here and Pablo there, and he's kind of like, you know, pivoting a little bit in his own career as well. I mean, we still are, I still refer to him as my partner and everything, but there's nothing like currently on the, on the front burner, except for, uh, the feature and shoot in October. Mm -hmm. That's good though. I mean, to keep consistent with those people though, even though it's like, you know, you guys are miles and miles away yeah he just keeps all the gear and i don't have to keep it in my house anymore so that's what our partnership is now yeah <laughs> i love that <laughs> solid that's, that's great uh what else do you want to talk about anything else you got going on that you want to that you want to mention i don't know man i mean i think that's that's pretty much it we're just out here trying to chase down that dream man and just get uh you know we're, we're going to start talk about casting we're gonna start raising money and you know, we've, we've really kind of just now gotten to the point where the, um, the feature is no longer something that we're going to do down the road or next year. It's happening this year. It's happening in six months. And so the fuse is kind of lit and it, there's, there's not really any, you know, like if we have to push it a couple months or something, there's no, there's no penalty for that, but it's important to, to have a plan to work toward that plan. And just in the last couple of weeks, we've started to like, you know, have our weekly phone calls and talk about funding sources and, you know, wh- which casting director we're going to hire and what our choices are for this and timeline on things and, and strategy. And it suddenly feels real instead of just like, a, you know, the, hey, there's this thing that we'd like to do down the road. Wouldn't it be great if we did it? It's like, oh, it's like, it's go time. We have six months to figure out how to get know seven hundred thousand dollars where is that going to come from and then right yeah you, know, that's, that's you got to put thing. it into place right do you do you have a kickstarter or like a gofundme going for that we don't um we may down the road uh there's some sort of there's some give and take to that as well i was saying with with uh short films it's it's um it's a visibility uh for the project certainly it helps with with grassroots but it's also uh it's a lot of work it's a it's a kickstarter uh you know i mean i'm asking for money of course it's great to you know I'm happy to put in the work to get them but it's like you know for the amount of of time that you really need to spend and take care of your of your backers because they're just giving you money it's not an investment when it's kickstarter indiegogo they're just here's money you know then it's there's a sense of obligation of keeping them updated all the time with sort of the state of the union and making sure that you have good perks for them, you know, whether it's, you know, a, a copy of the thing when it's done or, you know, whatever your incentives are for doing it. It's a, it's, it's an incredible amount of work um, that probably I, I, what we've been discussing is like, is it, is it a better use of your time to, take that whatever amount of money that you were you were goal oriented for the kickstarter and just trying to put that energy into um you know an investment and try to get those possibly even the same people give them the the hope that maybe they'll get their money back you know it's just there's there's a lot of considerations there so it it maybe 
maybe down the road, but right now, not yet. Nice. Well, we're, we're setting up, um, Kelly Beeman's actually setting up, um, a website for us and everything. So we're going to have, we're going to have links of everybody that was on the podcast, um, of everything that they want to promote or, um, anything. And it's going to be ongoing. So if, if in the future you get something like that, then we'll add it to the site once that's That's awesome. Yeah, totally. Yeah. We just want to, we want to promote things, you know, promote different people and what they're doing. Cause you know, outside of the day job, everyone has their own passions and everyone has their own stuff going on. And it's, it's, it's important to kind of highlight those things and let everybody learn each other, you know, more. Yeah, that's great. I think that's what, uh, you know, that's, that's what grassroots is. It's, it's supporting one another and, you know, trying to, help each other where they can. Right, buddy? <laughs> yeah. Any, any advice to leave off with? I mean, aside from all the other advice you've already given, like for people coming up in the industry or coming up and just starting out. You know, I don't know. I think, I think it's just, it's it really just, you gotta just, you just gotta get out there and do it. You know, you gotta, you gotta just see what, what works and what doesn't work. and somebody like me can sit here and talk about what I think, how it all works and how you should do your own stuff. But like, if you, if you just tried to follow, I think any one of our playbooks, it's probably not the best way to do it. It's the best way for me. I think I learned a lot working in reality TV, but you know, if you want to be Steven Spielberg, if you've taken the route that I took to get that way, it's probably not the, not the smartest thing to do. So I think just take it, take the advice from wherever, wherever it comes, because some of it will be bad and you can learn from bad advice too. Just trust your gut. Trust your gut. All right, Rags, anything else? I'm clear, baby. Tyler, dude, this was fun, man. Hang on for a second though. We're going to cut and we'll shoot the shit afterwards for a little bit. All right. All right. Thank you so much, man. Awesome talking to you.